Good day, Grade Tolls. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with calculus. Um, we're going to carry on with these last two examples. There's this example here and this one here. And then once we have finished going through these examples, we are going to move on to stats. And we're going to do some revision of stats and then move on to Grade 12 work of stats. So let's first finish these last two examples on calculus using differentiation, OK? And the reason I included these two, well, the one reason I included this one is because we are drawing a graph f of x is equal to x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x minus 4. They first asked us to work out the intercepts of both the x axes, which is a y intercept, and the other x intercepts. They're now going to ask us to work out the coordinates, and then there's the x coordinates of the point of inflection. So we're going to basically work out how to what the points are, the valid points are, and then we are going to draw this graph. Okay, and then we're going to answer some questions on it. So let's carry on, and I think I'm going to change color to dark blue. It wants the coordinates of the stationary points. So do you agree that the way we work out the stationary points is we find the first derivative of this and we let it equal zero and we solve for x. So if dashed of x is going to be 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. Okay, so then in order to find the local maximum, what do we need to do? We need to knit this equal zero and solve for it. So we've got 3x squared minus 12x plus 9 equals zero. Do you agree I can take out a common factor of 3 and you're left with x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals zero? So my factors would be x and x. The only factors that this can have are 3 and 1. This sign tells you that they're both the same and they're both minus. That equals zero. Therefore, we can say x equals three or x equals one. So x equals three or x equals one. So those are the x coordinates of my stationary points. I've got x equals three something or x equals one something. Now we need to find the y values and what do we do? We always substitute back into the original. So we're going to go f of 3 is equal to 3 cubed minus 6 times 3 squared plus 9 times 3 minus 4. Okay, so 3 cubed, do you agree, is 27. 3 times 3 is 9 times by 3 is 27. Minus 6 times 9 is 54 plus 9 times 3 is 27 minus 4. So that's 27 minus 54 is minus 27 plus 27 goes back up to 0. Minus 4 is the correct answer is negative 4. So this turning point is going to be 3 negative 4. Okay, and now to find out what this y value is, we're going to again going to substitute into the original. So we're going to go f of 1 is going to be 1 cubed minus 6 times 1 squared plus 9 times 1 minus 4, which is 1 minus 6 plus 9 minus 4. Okay, 1 minus 6 is minus 5, plus 9 is going to be B, 4, minus 4 is 0. And we should have kind of thought about the fact that that was probably going to happen because we already worked out that the, the coordinates of the, the, the intercepts of this are x equals 1 and x equals 1. So we should have known that there was going to be a turning point at x equals 1. Okay, so now we've got the x coordinates and the y coordinates of the stationary points. Now they want us to work out the x coordinate of the point of inflection. Now remember what is the point of inflection? The point of inflection is when the gradient of the graph goes through a point where it's zero, but the gradient doesn't change on either side. In other words, it stays the same. So in other words, the graph's going to continue going up in the same direction. It's just going to go through kind of like a bump. I'll draw it for you now. Okay. So for example, it could either be looking like this, so it'll go up and then go through zero and then up or vice versa. But that point there, at that point there, if 
double that if dash of x is going to equal zero. Okay, the first derivative is zero because that gradient is zero. Okay, but to find the x coordinate of the point of inflection, you need to find the second derivative of this and it's equal naught. So we're going to go f double dashed of x. Okay, the second derivative, which is the derivative of this. We take the two to the front and that becomes six x minus 12. And now all we have to do to find where the x coordinate is of the point of inflection is let that equal naught and solve for x. So we're going to have 6x minus 12 equals naught. Therefore, 6x equals 12. So x is equal to 2. So therefore, my point of inflection occurs at x equals 2. Right, now finally, the last step that we have is to draw this graph. Okay, so again, grade 12, I really, really urge you to use a ruler and to use pencils. In fact, you should be drawing these in pencils. They shouldn't be an alternative. Okay, but unfortunately, my software doesn't allow me to do anything except what I've got here. Okay, so we know it cuts at minus 4. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, more or less, minus 4. We know it touches the graph at x equals 1 and at x equals 4. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. We also know that the intercept is x equals 3, y, I mean, the, sorry, the coordinate of the stationary point is x is 3, y is equal to minus 4 as well. So when x is 3, y is minus 4, that's a stationary point. And we also have at 1, 0, okay? And we know it goes through minus 4 as well. Okay, so do you agree that this graph does this, okay? It is going up. And then it's going down and then it's going up okay so there you go this is our graph where x at this point here it's one at this point here it is four this is three minus four and at some point here where x equals two there is a point of inflection but we don't have to draw that in okay so this would be the y-axis and this would be the x-axis yay so there's our graph okay so now it says use your graph use the graph okay let me just erase that and rather use a highlighter it says use your graph to determine when f of x is smaller than or equal to zero so they want to know when is this graph smaller than or equal to zero. Do you agree that that means the y values of this graph must be smaller than or equal to zero? So it's going to be all the side of it, okay, that is on this side of four. Okay, so we could say that x has to be smaller than or equal to four because this is all, f of x here is all smaller to zero. So we could say that x has to be smaller than or equal to four. Okay, now the next one is quite an interesting one. Okay, it's saying it wants to know when we multiply f of x by its gradient will have greater than zero. Okay, so do you agree that a plus times a plus is going to be bigger than naught? And a minus times a minus is going to be bigger than naught. So we either have to have both the y values and the gradient have to be positive, okay? All the y values and the gradient have to be negative. Those are my options. Either the y value and the gradient have to be positive, or the y value and the gradient have to be negative. I mean, so that it'll be greater than naught. Okay, so let's have a look. And I'm going to change the highlighter again, not eraser, highlighter. Do you agree over here, the gradient is positive and the y value, I mean, yeah, and the y values are positive, okay? Over here, the gradient is positive, but the y values are negative. Over here, the y values are negative, and the gradient is negative. Over here, the y values are negative, but the gradient is positive because it's going up to the right. So now, do you agree 
that therefore we can say that it's from year to year works, okay? But we want greater than, only the greater than, so it doesn't include. So it's from one to three works and from four onwards works, okay? So what do we say? We're going to say x has to be smaller than three or bigger than one or x is going to be greater than four. At those points of the graph there, this is true. And that is one of the main reasons I wanted to include this, okay, because of this nice tricky thing, okay. Right, let's move on. Now they've got a very nice question. It says a cubic function has an equation. Y is equal to ax cubed plus x squared minus 8x plus b. It has a local minimum at the point minus 1, min 1 minus 9. Determine the values of a and b. Okay, so what are they telling us? They're telling us the equation is y is equal to ax cubed plus x squared minus 8x plus b. But telling us it is a local minimum, what do we know? We know that f dashed of x has to equal zero at x equals one. That is what it's saying. And by the way, do you agree that this is f of x, okay? We also know that that point works when x equals one, y equals minus nine for f of x, okay? So we can actually do two equations. The first equation is where we substitute that point into this equation and get something with a's and b's. So we're going to go minus 9 is equal to a times by 1 cubed plus 1 squared minus 8 times by 1 plus b. Okay, so we've got minus 9 is equal to a plus 1 minus 8 plus b. 1 minus 8 is minus 7, so we take it across, it becomes plus 7. So you've got minus 9 plus 7 is a plus b. Therefore, minus 2 is a plus b. So let's just leave that there as equation 1. Okay, we'll worry about what we're going to solve for a or b first after we've done this next bit. The next bit is that we know that we've got a local minimum at this point. So when x is 1, f dashed of x equals 0. So let's find f dashed of x. f dashed of x is equal to 3ax squared plus, we bring the 2 to the front, becomes 2x minus 8. And we know that this equals 0 when x equals 1 because that's how the local minimums work, okay? So we know the 3a times by 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 8 equals 0. Because, like I said, we know that this point here, when x equals 1, this local minimum is going to be equal to 0. The, I mean, this is the local minimum, so the first derivative equals 0. So we've got... 3a plus 2 minus 8 is equal to 0. 2 minus 8 is minus 6. When you take it across, it becomes plus 6. So you've got 3a is equal to 6. So a is equal to 2. Awesome, a. So therefore, we can substitute into there. Let me just check this because it becomes minus 6. Take it across, it becomes plus 6, yes. So now we have a equals 2. So we've got minus is equal to 2 plus b. So do you agree that b is going to be minus 4? Awesome. So we've discovered the equations of a and b, the values of a and b, by realizing that we can substitute this point into the original to find the equations of a and b. And because we know that this is a local minimum, we can find the first derivative and substitute in the x value and let it all equal to naught and solve for the variable. Okay, so those are very nice maximum questions and calculus questions. Let's move on to stats. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about histograms. Okay, so what is a histogram? This is a histogram. Okay, a histogram is effectively a bar graph. Okay, but it is not got gaps between them. The difference between a bar graph and a histogram is that the bar graph has got gaps between it and the histogram has do, does not. 
And there's a reason for this. A bar graph will compare different things, whereas a histogram will compare the same things. So in other words, yeah, you've got the number of students, and yeah, this is a score on the final test. So in other words, this is the same type of thing. Okay, so we can compare the score of the final exam versus the number of students, okay? And it's usually used to display grouped data. So in other words, we're not going to, so in other words, it'll be that 10 students got between 0 and 20, 10 and oh, 5 students got between 0 and 20, 10 students got between 20 and 40, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So it is usually used to display group data. There are no spaces between the bars, and again, that's because we're comparing like with like. Okay, so an example here is a frequency distribution of height of 25 students. So you can see here that there's zero students that got these heights. I'm sorry about it being so grabby. I don't know why it's like this. Okay, so we've got two students that got between 58 and 60 inches, two students that got between 60 and 62, five each that got between 62 and 64 and 64 and 66, et cetera, et cetera, okay. So now it says how many students have a height between 70 and 72 inches? Well, we just go over here and we go, oh, well, look, there's 70 by 72. And we go read that number and that number is two. So the correct answer is two. So very obviously histograms are really easy to read. It says which height group has the smallest frequency? Well, if we ignore the zeros, the height group that there's a smaller frequency is 72 to 74 inches because that is the lowest number. Obviously, if we include the zeros, it would be both 54 to 56 and 56 to 58. Now we want to look at plotting a histogram. So the first thing you need to do is take information that you get given. Okay, so what would happen is you would do an experiment and you would record a whole bunch of information. So for example, you could have this here, which is a health fitness group conducted a survey to find out which age group most frequently use the gym. Okay, now they've asked us to draw a stem and leaf diagram. So what you do is you start off with one because this is going to stand for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, okay? So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and let's just push it eight, okay? So then when you have 30, you actually have to write a zero. So you put a zero for when you have 30. With the 14, you put a four, okay? 21, you put a one, okay? There you've got another 30. See how easy this is? 18 is over there now. 27 is over there. 30 again is over here. 26 is over here. 31 is over there, etc., etc. And you'll see that there's an 82 and a 70. There's an 81. Okay, and at 83, sure, a lot of octogenarians. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up with a stem and leaf diagram that looks like this, okay? So you can see that you've got all these people, they are four, these people are, the, and the ages are 14, 15, 15, sorry, 14, 14, 15, 15, 15, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19. Whereas, yeah, you can say the ages are 80, 81, 82, and 83. Okay, so that is your stem and leaf diagram, which you need to know how to draw. Now, we need to look at our class interval. So what we've done is we've broken this up into brackets of ages, okay? So obviously this is pretty obvious. It's gonna be 10 to 19, then 20 to 29, and 30 to 39. Those are very obvious, okay? So then obviously there's one smaller than this, which is going to be 0 to 9. So the frequency of this is gonna be zero. From 10 to 19, you just count. It becomes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, okay, and so on, until you get a table that looks like this, where you can take as 0 to 11, 14, 17, 13, 7, 6, 5, 4, and 0. And now we're asked to use that information to draw a histogram. So remember that 
it's remember that it's a grouped thing. Okay, it's grouped. So we can say that, for example, how many groups are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I would make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Good. So in other words, this bit here would be from naught to nine. 10 to 19 all the way through to 90 to 99 right so from 0 to 9 do you agree we've got zero kids so it's just along the straight line but from 10 to 19 we've got 11 okay the biggest number we have is 17 so do you agree we have to be able to go up to 20 so i'm going to go 2 4 6 8 10 12 14 16 18 20. Okay, so we can't quite double it. There's not enough. So that's fine. Now the next one is 11. So it is going to be just above 10. So it's going to be 11. It's going to be 11. And remember, you need to join the dots, join the lines. And remember, you should be using a ruler. Okay, then you have 0, 21 to 20 to 29 gives you 14. So that would be 20 to 29 gives you 14. So that would be up here and across. Okay. So you get the gist. Okay. That is what it would look like. Okay. So then let's just do the next one. It's 17 from 30 to 39. So that would be 30 to 39. And you're going to go up to 17. And we will see in a couple of slides what the actual final answer is but that's how you would do it okay so what is a frequency polygon a frequency polygon is a histogram but what has happened is that a line is joined from the center of the information to connect the middle the top of each bar okay so frequency polygon connects the coordinates of the center of each interval and the count of each interval so in other words it'd be 0 to 10 is 2 from here 10 to 20 is 5. So if we look at this one, this is actually the polygon that I was drawing, okay? Here it is. I started there. You can see there's 0 and then 10, then 4, well, 11, then 14, and then um, what is that? 17. So if you go back, you can see that this is what we were drawing. Not, I mean, not 11, 14, 17. So this is a histogram, okay? If I now join these dots, okay, and label them. So in other words, the midpoint from 0 to 9 is 4.5. The midpoint from 10 to 19 is 14.5. The midpoint from 20 to 29 is 24.5. So what have I done? I have joined the central points and I've worked out the midpoint of each of these parts okay each of these groups okay so that is the difference between a histogram and a frequency polygon all that happens is i am basically joining the midpoints of each class right so now that we've got that done let's look at the cumulative frequency now cumulative frequency is a very very useful tool and it's often used to work out your interquartile ranges etc and you need to know how to draw it so let's talk about it they're also known as ogives or ogives it really depends on your teacher it really doesn't matter how you say it as long as you know what it means and they ask you to draw either a cumulative frequency graph or an ogive or an ogive it makes a difference how you say it as long as you know what to do okay so what it does it reflects the cumulative frequency in other words we're adding up the frequency so it's a running total of the frequency it's typically s-shaped so you'll have some speeding up and then you have some slowing down happening okay so let's look at an example it says a group of learners achieve the following marks out of 30 so you can see two learners achieve 23 to achieve 21, 5, achieve 22, etc., all the way up to 2, 3, 29 out of 30. So do you agree if I said to you how many learners achieved 2 out of the, out of the I mean, achieved 20 out of 30? Do you agree I would just say 2? 
But if I said to you, how many learners achieve 21 and less? It would be all these kiddies plus these kiddies that achieve 21 and less, okay? But now, in order to really solve this, we need to draw a cumulative frequency table. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna write down the marks, then we're gonna write down the frequency, and then we're gonna write down the cumulative frequency. Okay, so do you agree that we've got the marks are 20 and your frequency is two? Here it is 21 and the frequency is three. Here it's 22 and the frequency is five. Here is 23 and the frequency is five. Here is 24 and the frequency is seven, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that we are writing down all these numbers, okay? But now what are we going to do? The cumulative frequency is adding up not just what we had in our page, but the one before it. Okay, so let me just finish this. So 25 is going to be 10, 26 is 13, 27 is 5, 28 is 4, and 29 is 2. Okay, so now if we add this up, that should add up to 30 because we were told if you recall that we had 30 learners. Okay, no, I didn't, it's just a group of learners. So if we add this up, we'll know how many learners took part in the test. So it'll be two plus three is five, plus five is 10, 15, 20, 25. And then that's 31, 41, 44, 51. Okay, so it's about 50 students. So now if we, 56 apparently, did I not count right? Two, three, five, five, seven, ten, thirteen, five, four, two. Hmm, I think I added up incorrectly. Two plus three is five, so that's five. Plus five is ten, so it's go away. Then plus five is fifteen, that can go away, but now plus five is twenty. Then thirty, then forty-three, then fifty, and then yes, it is fifty-six. There are fifty-six students in total that drew or wrote to this test, okay? Now, what is the cumulative frequency? The cumulative frequency is addition of the frequency in the right order. So in other words, we can say two people got 20 and below, but five people got 21 and below, okay? Five, three of them got 21 and two got 20, but all together, five of them got 21 and below. Similarly over here, we can add five now and then we have 10. So 10 people got 22 and below. 10 people got 22 and 21 and 20, okay? Next, we've got 23, so we've got 15 people got 23 and below. Then we've got seven, so it's 22 people got 24 and below. Then it's 10, so it's 32 and it's Oof, okay, so do you understand that we've got 32 people got 25 and below. So we end up with something that looks like this. 2, 5, 10, 15, 22, 32, 45, 50, 54, and 56. And obviously that number needs to match that number unless someone over here messed up and wrote a wrong section or something. Okay, so now we need to plot it. Okay, so we're going to plot the marks okay versus the cumulative frequency so in other words we got two people that got 20 so let's just turn a second so if it's 20 21 2 2 2 3 2 4 2 5 2 6 2 7 2 8 2 9 30 okay so we can go 2 we can go 0 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 <coughs> Um, let's try again. Let's, let's erase the ink on the side. And sorry, we're going from 20 through to 29. So I can go, um, okay, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Okay. So do you agree that two people got a frequency of two? Five people got a frequency of, so that's two, four, six, eight. 
So five people got a frequency of um, 21. Okay. Tw and 10 people got a frequency of 22 and below. So 10 people got a frequency of 22 and below. Okay, then 15 people got a frequency of 23 and below. So it's 15, 10, uh, let me go 10, 12, 14, 16. So it's going to be one lower. So it's going to be there you go. So you end up with a graph that looks like this. Okay, 2021, etc, etc. So you can see it forms a beautiful S shape. Okay, now we need to use this graph to determine in things. Okay, and they love asking you to do this. And the tricky thing is normally we read along the one axis and then measure up, okay? In this one, we do it the other way around, okay? So we know that we've got a total of 56 recordings. So if we want to get the Q1, the interquartile number, okay, we need to take the total number of readings, we add one and we divide it by four, okay, to find the quarter mark. And you see that it is 14.25, okay? So what we are saying is that the lower quartile lies between the 14th and 15th learner's mark. Between the 14th and 15th learner's mark. So then we can say, right, in other words, if we had Q1 is going to be between the 14th learner's 14th and 15th mark, okay? The median, we're going to say Q1 is going to be 56 plus 1. It's a half this time, which is 28.5. The median lies between the 28th and 29th of the lead learner's marks, okay? Whereas the upper quartile is three quarters of 56.1, so that's going to be at 42.7, okay? So in other words, the upper quartile lies between the 42nd and 43rd learner's marks. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that the lower quartile lies between the 14th and 15th learner marks. There's the 14th and there's the 15th. So I can draw a line across, and yes, guys, you need to use a pen. I mean, you use pencil and eraser. So therefore, we can if we take that down and we take it down. We think that the lowest mark is about approximately 23. Okay, that's the Q1. Is that is Q1? Okay, the median is 28.5. So you're going to go up to 26, 28, 28.5. So it goes across there and goes down here and you can see that it is what it is about 24 and a half 25 okay so that's about 24 and a half 25 and finally the upper quartile is 42.75 42.75 so it's over here around about and we take it across and please use a reader when you take it across and you can see that it works out to be approximately, approximately 26. Okay, so now you see how we can use the cumulative frequency graph to work out our lower quartile, our Q1, our median, and our upper quartile. And now we're going to talk about why those numbers are important. So first of all, let's look at about the measures of central tendency. We've got the mean. The mean is just the average value of the set of data. You just add it all up and you divide, okay? The median is the middle value of an ordered set of data. So this time you take the data and you organize it in um, ascending order, descending order, and the middle number, the middle number of the ordered data is the median. The mode is the one that happens the most often. Okay, that's all it is. So if we had to go back now, okay, and we had to look at these, let's go back up. If we had to look at these marks, do you see that the mark that happens the most often is actually this one here, okay, the 26. So therefore, this dude is our mode. Over here, we've got a numbers going from 5 to 7 to 10, so that's a plus 2, that's a plus 3, that's a plus 3, and then it drops down to 5. 
So if I wanted to look at the mode, I mean the median, the median is a middle value of the ordered set of data and the mode is the one that happens most often. So the median is the one that's in the middle of the ordered set of data. So if we count them, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the median is going to be the fifth one. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let me try again. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So that there. Yeah. It's kind of tricky because of the fact that it's the it's the frequency changes this. Okay. The mode. Okay. The mode is a pretty obvious one because that's thirteen. The median. Remember we said the median is we saw was twenty five. So if you go back up here, you can see that the median year is going to be about 25. It's between the two. Okay, and then we've got the mean. And the means are really easy. You just add them up and divide. Okay, now let's talk about the range. The range is the maximum value, value minus the minimum value. So if again we had to look at this, this data, you would see the maximum value that we get is 29 and the minimum is 20 so the, for the range is going to be 9 because it's going from 20 to 29 okay you're happy with that and then finally the mid okay wait the interquartile range the interquartile range is the dis, dis, distance from the q3 minus q1 so if we go back here we saw the upper quartile q3 was 42.75 and Q1 is 14.25. So the interquartile range is always Q3 minus Q1, which in this case is going to be 42,75 minus 14,25. So the interquartile range is at 0, 05. 12 minus 4 is 8, and 3 minus 1 is. So the interquartile range is 28,5. And now that we want to talk about standard deviation. Standard deviation is how far the data is from the mean. Okay, how far the average data is away from the mean. How far does it skew away? Okay, but we're going to do questions. And when we do these questions, I'll show you how to do this. Because we do this thing. It's horrible. And we do that on our calculator. And I will show you how to do it, even though the, my calculator is an HP. And you're probably using either Casio or Sharp. It's kind of the same method, no matter what which calculator you have. If it's not exactly the same method, then go use your, um, go look at the manual for your calculator and it'll tell you how to do it. Okay, so now let's talk about the five number summary. We've kind of spoken about it already, but you need to know what the five number summary is and how to represent it in a box and whisker plot. Okay, so the minimum data value is obvious. It's just the minimum. Lowest quartile is obviously the lowest quartile that we've spoken about. Median, upper quartile, maximum value. Very easy. It can be represented by a box and whisker plot. So if you look at this, this is a box and whisker plot. These things here are called the whiskers, and this here is the box, okay? And you can see that there's the minimum value, and this is the maximum value. Here's Q1, okay, and here's Q3, and Q2 is right in the middle. And in this case, the reason that this is kind of in the middle is because of the fact that it's almost symmetrical. This has got a difference of two and this one's got a difference of three. So it's a little bit skewed, but not skewed a lot. Okay, so I would say it's almost symmetrical. And we will continue talking about symmetrical data and skewed data in the next lesson, um, which is tomorrow. I hope you have a great evening. Cheers.